Christopher Gorham is a lawyer and teacher of modern American history at Westford Academy outside of Boston. He has degrees in history from Tufts University and the University of Michigan, where he studied under legendary historian Sidney Fine. Gorham has a JD summa cum laude from Syracuse University College of Law, where he served on the editorial staff of the Syracuse Law Review. His writing has appeared in the Washington Post and in online journals. Our interviewer today is Kelsey Hasden, an adjunct professor of composition at the University of North Florida and Florida State College at Jacksonville. She holds a bachelor's degree in English focusing on post-colonial theory and women's studies and a master's degree in rhetoric and composition. She writes about a range of issues and events, dines out as often as she can, and attends events around Jacksonville. Kelsey writes and edits articles for the Jackson and Modern Cities. I'm gonna turn it over to you, Kelsey. Thank you so much. Um, I do have a short two minute trailer for Christopher's book to share with everyone. So let me bring that up. The New York Times called her one of the most influential women in the country's public affairs for a quarter of a century. Life magazine said she was far and away the most important woman in American government. Her name was Anna Rosenberg, and her story has never been told before. I came over here from Budapest when I was eight years old. She made her own way in a man's world. They were amazed, they were shocked, they were uh, troubled, but I must say most of them were just a little bewildered. She was invited into the circle of a couple named Franklin and Eleanor. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And became an advisor and confidant to a president in peace and war. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. As the Cold War exploded into conflict, she was named to the highest position any woman had ever held in the American military. This is Rosenberg, wartime envoy of Presidents Roosevelt and Truman. Will add then, Joe McCarthy targeted her as a communist. Where a communist is concerned, she is not a free agent. That's a goddamn lie. The Confidant. Coming March 2023. I love how dramatic that is. <laughs> <laughs> So Christopher, um, my first question is after reading this, this incredible history, how did you even hear about her? Well, it's a, it's, it's kind of a cool story. Uh, I had seen a picture of President Truman having a hearty laugh with, uh, with this very stylish dressed uh, woman and the caption said, this is about five or six years ago. The caption said, Anna Rosenberg, Assistant Secretary of Defense. Now I'm a history teacher, uh, like Katie said, uh, here in the Boston suburbs. And, you know, I've heard of Frances Perkins and uh, obviously Eleanor Roosevelt. And, you know, when I saw a, a woman, a picture of a woman from 1950 as the number two person in the Pentagon, I thought, well, surely there's gotta be a book about this person. So I put her name on the list of topics for my students to write research papers on, and a couple of students chose her. Then they came yeah. to me and said, Mr. Gorham, there's no, there's no books. We can't find anything on her. So we dug a little deeper, and we found that, that Anna, Rosenberg, Anna Rosenberg's papers were actually at, at Harvard's Schlesinger University, uh, at Schlesinger Library. And the library is only about 20 miles from us. So we all went to the library. And the librarians, you know, wheeled out the, the boxes of documents. Uh, 
and, you know, handed out the silk gloves. And it was just a couple of seconds later, a student said, Mr. Gorham, come here. And uh, she'd open up the box and there was literally like a, a signed citation for President Harry Truman. And then you take that out and there's letters from Franklin Roosevelt and Eleanor Roosevelt, and General Eisenhower, uh, Senator Johnson, uh, Congressman Lyndon Johnson, Vice President Lyndon Johnson, um, Lady Bird, Mimi Eisenhower, just on and on, Kelsey. It was a, a treasure trove of history. And uh, really, I thought then and there that I would be the one to write the book. That, <clears throat> so... As a former professor and one who was a huge advocate of taking my classes to the library and here is a list of topics, please go research. Yes. The thought of my class sitting there and like being able to go through these historical documents, I mean, that's incredible. Like what, what kind of an effect did that have on your students? Well, I, I hope it had, and I, I do think it did have, um, you know, it opened up a new door for them in history. You know, they, they're they used to, you know, they can open up a, a database uh, at, at our school library. They can open up a book, certainly they mm -hmm. get from the library, but to have, you know, three-dimensional things and the whole concept yeah. of archives, you know, was just a, it was a new thing for them. You know, it was like, you know, folks, you can conduct interviews too. You know, you can go and you can find experts in the field and see if they'll talk to you. So I like to think that over the years, uh, I've opened some doors for for my students in terms of, the materials that they can bring to bear in their research. This was certainly one of them. Yeah. And so what, so you say you were like, oh, I know I'm going to be the one to write this book, but like, how, how, what was it like actually doing all the research? Because right, like you said, your kids, I mean, right, you do a Google search and there's nothing, yes. right? And so can you walk us through some of Sure. I, absolutely. Um, I I actually live closer to Harvard than the school where I teach, so I'm on the bus line. So I think we we saw the paper her papers on a, a Tuesday or Wednesday. I was at the library on Saturday, and just digging through. And I basically was that was my weekends for the the next several months. Is I would go on Saturday and Sunday and go to the library and and open up the archives there and 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 do digging. And what I found was almost like Zelig or like a, like an intentional Forrest Gump, Anna Rosenberg was involved in so many different things, all these pivot points of history, just one after another. So I was writing in parallel, and I think a lot of people do this. I was writing it sort of in parallel with the research. And mm -hmm. fortunately, you know, she had such a, a jam-packed career that I was able to sort of, you know, jump from one pivot point of history to the next and transition um, not that the narrative writing wasn't hard or challenging or not that I didn't make every single mistake that I possibly could have made, but that's kind of was the rhythm. It was just going to the library and, and doing a little writing and a lot of research sort of at the same time. Yeah, <clears throat> that's incredible. And you said, so how long would you say it took you to do the research and at least have that first draft to send out it was i remember it very distinctly because i had i was writing and researching at the same time from april to about december and then someone suggested and i had i don't know uh maybe uh maybe 100 and 200 pages of of stuff it wasn't really yet a narrative history but i had i had stuff i had sort of a the early makings of a pitch and somebody at my school suggested I talk to a local author, a guy named Stephen Paleo, who's written some really remarkable books about the experience uh, of, of the city of Boston, the people who live here. I called him uh, and we talked, we were on the phone for about an hour. This is in December of 2019. And, I, you know, I was going to just uh, self-publish the book or even like print out copies of a bound volume and just kind of <laughs> give it out. And he said, you have something here. He said, this is, this is a, this is a commercial history. This is something that really deserves uh, to be told, you know, through a through an agent, through a publishing house, through the traditional ways. So that was sort of the that opened up a door for me, and um, it was about a it was it was about another three or four or five months where I I, I was able to find an agent, lucky enough to get an agent, and uh, that and that started a whole new process. Yeah. Oh man. Um... <clears throat> 
what, uh, sorry, I'm looking at my notes. Um, was there a, in your research, right? I mean, there are, there's so many people that she works with. There are so many events, right? That she is associated with. Was, was there a person or an event or anything that you came across that you've kind of like maybe put a pin in, like that was super interesting. And I want to come back to that later. Well, there was one that I, I found Kelsey quite late in the research and it was uh, very late in the research as a matter of fact. And it was uh, um, just an, I don't even remember how I found it, but there was a meeting minutes from Temple Sisterhood from 1946. It was a Jewish women's organization and they were They'd had a meeting. Uh, I, 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 I don't even remember where the meeting was, maybe Cleveland, Ohio, or something like that. Uh, in that meeting, Anna Rosenberg spoke. She didn't speak very long, but she spoke for just a couple of paragraphs worth. But she had gone to one of the very newly liberated concentration camps in 1945 on her second mission to Europe for FDR. And it was it was the first time I think anyone had ever seen that she had actually visited the concentration camps. I mean, it was in no... None of the other previous uh, academic scholars that had written chapters of her career had ever seen that. I had never seen that. Uh, and like I said, it was in this pretty obscure, you know, dusty, dusty volume of, of, of stuff. But it, it was very profound because I think she only spoke about it the one time. And obviously, you know, meeting, she was one of the first allied women to see the inside of a concentration camp. I mean, the survivors were still there. I mean, the, the people in the, the terrible uniforms, uh, the striped uh, ragged uniforms were still there, still alive, uh, you know, struggling to survive. And she met those people and, and, you know, felt uh, very profoundly about that. So that was something that needed to be in the book. Um, that the detail that you included where she basically explains, right. She's meeting seeing these people for the first time these men women children yes yes and she feels this need and i think this really speaks to her character and her success both in her um uh her consultation work but also politically right is how she was so innately giving and she's just right like kind of looking around and she yeah. pulls what was it a lipstick out of her purse and she's like right just the sheer the extreme difference in like what this woman she's seeing has experienced and this item that she's pulling out and yep. and you describe in there you write the woman looks at it it's as if this is the entire world just right here yeah and so yep. um I don't know if there's anything that you anything additional do you can speak to that but that well, was a very heard thing so she gave, this is Anna Rosenberg's second trip to, during World War II, the, her second trip to wartime Europe, both at the at the behest of Franklin Roosevelt. And she was his basically personal emissary uh, in the fall of 1944. And again, in the spring of 1945, he'd actually died, but she was, she was in Europe after he'd ordered her over there for this second trip. So she goes to... Uh, Generals Eisenhower, Patton, and Bradley had liberated this or seen this newly liberated camp, and they immediately cabled Washington. You know, I want you to send journalists, Congress people, uh, you know, send people to bear witness to this atrocity. And Anna happened to be in Europe at the time, so they they flew her to Nordhausen, which is the camp that she saw. And yes, as you say, you know, she 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 felt guilty. She said because she didn't have clothing or food. But what she did have is pencils, a notebook, and a lipstick. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I like to think that, you know, she gave this woman back a sense of self that had been taken from her and a sense of maybe even the pencil symbolic of, you know, to, to bear witness, to write down, uh, to, to memorialize the terrible things so that they're never forgotten. And, of course, the lipstick to become human again, to become a woman again. Um, so symbolically, those things. I think Anna realized might've meant something to this woman. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I, sorry, I get, that was a section I actually read a couple of times. I have a six-year-old and a two-year-old and they kept interrupting me and I was like, <laughs> stop it. This is, 
you know, like it, it was such a moving section. It that, was, it was. You know, I, I had to read it a couple of times. Um, I think one of the other really moving sections for me um, was the chapter that you wrote where she works with a Philip Randolph. Yes. Who is um, a beloved person here in Jacksonville. Um, while we have a street named after him, I don't think we memorialize him as well as we could, but you had mentioned in our correspondence that there's a statue of him in Boston. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, if you could just speak on, you know, what, um, how Anna worked with him, um, but also, you know, how, how do you, how does Boston have a statue of Asa Philip Randolph? <laughs> sure. Um, and forgive me and your listeners, uh, because this this response might go on for a while. But uh, you know the the subtitle of the book is the unknown, untold story of the woman who helped win World War II. And Anna Rosenberg, uh, you know, this name that she was famous back in the '40s and up into the late '50s, really, or, or even early '60s. But then we forgot about her. She just completely disappeared uh, from history. But she was famous. I think that's that's an important point to to make. Um, the how she helped America win World War II was both. I think we we talked a little about Europe just now, but flipping back to the to the home front, in the months right before Pearl Harbor brought the United States into World War II, uh, in in the months before that, the defense industries were already cranking up, building the tanks and the planes and the ordnance and the belt buckles and the helmets, and those were good paying jobs. They were union jobs, and they were not being offered to Black Americans. Uh, black Americans were being told, quite frankly, by by the unions and by the by these companies, you know, janitors only, house painters, um, porters, and the like. And the black leader of the day, A. Philip Randolph, th this was untenable. You know, that they wanted to, to desegregate. Black Americans wanted to desegregate the armed forces, and they wanted to have a fair shake at these defense jobs. So Randolph proposed a march on Washington, uh, together with Walter White of the NAACP. And Roosevelt was in a pickle because his wife, the first lady, was essentially in favor of this. Uh, and what worried President Roosevelt, though, was, you know, Washington at the time was still a southern mentality, still a southern town. He was worried that, you know, you get black marchers and white cops and, you know, you're going to have you're going to be showing to the world a caste system that we really don't want to show at the moment. We want unity to go fight fascism abroad. So it was a real pickle for the president. He called in, you know, by this time he's calling Anna Rosenberg, his missus fixed it. He, he calls in Anna uh, and he says, I want you to go, you know, interface with, with Eleanor. I want you to, to talk to A. Philip Randolph and Walter White and let's see if we can get, if we can get this uh, mediated, which was her, her sort of professional job was a labor mediator. So she met with all the parties in New York and the black leaders were like, nope, we, you know, unless there's an executive order, we're not going to play. And so a, a very high stakes, dramatic meeting was called for Washington at the White House. And of course, Anna, you know, Roosevelt wanted Anna to be there. Uh, Randolph and White were there. Uh, members of the, you know, higher ups in the military were there. Uh, Fiorella LaGuardia was there. And it was a very sour meeting. They did not come to an agreement. Randolph said, you know, we want something done, Mr. President, and done now. And Roosevelt tried to drag his feet. Finally, LaGuardia said, let's let's call a, a let's call a, you know, a break. And Roosevelt sent Anna into the cabinet room with the black leaders to try and hammer out a deal. And it took a couple of weeks. But the deal they hammered out was what became Executive Order 8802 which mandated the hiring of black Americans and actually set up the, the Fair Employment Practices Commission, which was the watchdog provision. And, you know, historian David Kennedy says this is the first real federal action on uh, civil rights since Reconstruction. And it was, you know, I, I make the argument in the in the book that Anna Rosenberg was the chief drafter of that. You know, she was mediating not between a union and management, but between the president of the United States and black America. And uh, it worked. <clears throat> So let's start kind of keeping tabs right here, right? So she's helped to push forth equal rights, employment, civil rights. She has had um, her hand in World War II. She has met with the survivors 
of the camps, right? She is, as you said, the confidant, right? The Mrs. Fixit for FDR, right? She, which we have not talked about quite yet, but she's also pushed to have women um, involved in employment to produce everything that was required to be sent out for World War II, right? Um, did you want to speak on that for? I think, yeah, I, 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 her, she had a philosophy when, when the war, before the war broke out, President Roosevelt knew that this was going to be a different kind of war. Not, not where, where it wasn't just men on the battlefield versus men on the battlefield. It was going to be society versus society. And the, the speed at which one nation could strike another nation had just, you know, it had multiplied. You know, you could, you could have high altitude bombers and you could have, you know, uh, high powered ships, uh, you know, aircraft carriers and the like. Anna Rosenberg also realized that very early on. She knew that American women were going to have to be part of any victory was going to require millions of American women. And she knew that immediately. So in 42 and 43, when the arsenal of democracy, you know, we think that you just flip on a switch and then Ford Motor Company is building tanks and, and Chrysler's building planes and everything's good. There was a real problem in 42 and 43 because the, the labor pool wasn't, there was a surplus of labor in New York. There weren't enough workers elsewhere. Uh, contracts were being broken. Uh, material wasn't being sent to the allies or, or stockpiled here at home. And Roosevelt had his Mrs. Fix-It, uh, Anna Rosenberg, go to Buffalo, Niagara region, Buffalo, New York, which was this massive defense hub. They built everything, you know, parachutes, bombs, uh, ships, uh, aircraft. You know, they were giving aircraft to the Russians, aircraft to the Brits, and bombs to both countries that were fighting uh, Nazi Germany. And Anna Rosenberg had to essentially come up with a workforce, uh, you know, almost 100,000 people. And immediately it was clear more women, not just not just single women, but married women, married women with children. And these women needed because they were going to be working all night. They were going to be working the, the different shifts. They needed uh, child care. They needed they needed parks to be open at three and four in the morning with heat. Uh, they needed movie theaters to be open at five in the morning. So if they got off their shift and wanted to de-stress they needed a place to cash their check at three in the morning, four in the morning. So she thought of all those ancillary things too. Um, Black Americans in Buffalo were, were hired on in numbers never before seen. Anna told the leaders of Buffalo, this is no time for discrimination, all hands on deck. You, you, know, you have to get that out of your mind, that discriminatory practices. High schoolers came in and pitched in, disabled Americans. And her model one magazine called it her label labor model. One magazine called it the Rosenberg plan. Others called it the Buffalo plan was rolled out nationwide. It became the labor uh, cognate to the arsenal of democracy and allowed the country to, to fire on all cylinders and ultimately to be victorious. She, <clears throat> so that was all with World War II and yes. FDR. In comes, um, was it Truman? with yes. uh, the next president that she worked with. And she was also an emissary for him to Korea um, to meet with some of the soldiers there. And one, right, just the fact that both of these presidents, is, and this is the first I've heard of this, every president could have done this, I would not know, but this is the first time <laughs> sending someone um, to go speak with these soldiers out on the ground, um, out in the battlefield, she was eating with them. She was yes. sleeping in the same types of quarters as them. She was right wearing wearing the clothes. Yes. She um, did not have these special accommodations because she was a woman. Um, and part of uh, so a little bit of what you just described, right, was how she was able to see this entire the entire picture. Yes. Right. Yes. And how brilliant she was when she met with these soldiers um, and, and talked to them. Could you speak a little bit about what she was doing when she was meeting with these soldiers in, what was it, three? Three times she went out twice with World War II and then once with Korea? Four times, actually. She was in, in the battle zone in World War II two times. 
and then in, in Korea two times. So she made okay. four, four trips to war zones and you're exactly right. You know, another person, not Anna Rosenberg, you know, might've played the VIP role, you know, and, and had the soldiers line up and, it, and, you know, address the soldiers that way. That was so not her. She not only had the, the sort of the heart that, you know, she was very motherly about these young guys, these young soldiers, but she had also learned from Eleanor Roosevelt to lift up the lid on the soup pot, to, to open up the foot locker, you know, to, you know, to pull back the yeah. curtain of the hospital and see how, how things really are. And, and Franklin Roosevelt used Eleanor Roosevelt as that kind of emissary because obviously he was, you know, wheelchair bound. And Anna learned that or, or combined that with her own open heartedness. So when she went to Korea and indeed World War II, when she went to France, um, it was you know, it was uh, literally taking the guys away from their, their commander and saying, Hey, yeah. fella, come on over here. And, you know, she would say, give me the lowdown. What's, what's the food like? Do you have dry boots? Do you have dry socks? You know, are your weapons uh, operable? And, and she, you know, demanded that they give her the the straight story. And, you know, she was just, they, in doing that, she earned their respect. This was not a VIP mm -hmm. from Washington. This was a, sort of a, a you know high official but she was really kind of motherly and she was really the link between those those men on the battlefield and their commander in chief so she was very popular with it with the GIs both in World War II and Korea yeah um one of the scenes you described she <clears throat> asked if they had the right like socks and like boot protectors and they didn't and she went to the commanding officer and he's like okay I'll get that fixed tomorrow and she said no you will do that now today. She said, I'm right? going to stay on this phone. Yes. Until, until I will wait. I will wait here until it's done. That's right. And that, that gumption, you know, I mean, just you see through and through in so many ways, one in the way to just sit down with the guys and like, Hey, can you pass me a cigarette? Let's talk about, you know, yeah. yeah. yeah right what do your socks have holes in them right like let's let's get the real story here meeting with a philip randolph and speaking to yeah. him one-on-one -on -one and saying let's get the real story here yeah. right i mean she was a real problem solver right and she really pushed for equity for everyone yeah. and so yeah. to add to her list right of all these accomplishments right she also pushed to have um, a stronger, more welcoming homecoming for the vets coming home. That's right. Um, could you speak a little bit about how, what she did and maybe, I mean, we can probably tell how she did it right with great empathy and with the, with the gumption. Right. But yeah. <laughs> if you could, I, yeah. Um, I want to, before I switch over to the sort of the, the homecoming, um, there's a photo in the book. It's it's her grandson's favorite photo of her, and it's it's one of my favorite photos of her. But she's in Korea. She's dressed in fatigues, just like the soldiers, and she's kneeling. Uh, you know, her knees in the dirt, and they're all kneeling around her. And it's integrated troops. It's black, white. It's Latino. It's you know, it's all the troops that were in Korea. And when she first got to Korea, uh, one of the journalists said, um, "How many black troops are serving in Korea?" And she said, "That's not the question." The question is how many American troops are. So, you know, that lifelong commitment to to civil rights and and um, in terms of the homecoming, you know, she had seen, especially true in the very first trip she took to war to war tour in Europe. Um, she was there just weeks after D-Day and she saw everything that the soldiers would have seen. Um, dead comrades, dead enemy, uh, widows, orphans, destroyed villages. You know, we know that where she went in France and it was. It was a, a zone of death and destruction, the Falaise Gap. And she knew that these men, when they came back, were not going to be, and women, uh, were not going to be the same when they returned to the United States. And she fought somewhat in vain, but she fought very much for psychological counseling to be added to veterans services. And, you know, she was made fun of in the newspapers because, you know, they people just hadn't gotten around to it. But, you know, PS, PTSD, you know, it was not labeled as such back then but she realized having seen what they saw that you don't you don't come back from war quite the same and you know she wanted the women that had served 
to be given the same heroic welcome that the men were. And she was disappointed that that didn't happen. You know, the women kind of took off those those whack uniforms and wave uniforms and took off the bandanas that they wore when they were riveting the, the, the Boeings together and kind of just went back into life. Whereas the men, you know, were able to bask in the glory of being the, the returning warrior. Um, but for both men and women, uh, both in terms of their, you know, buying homes, getting an education and having psychological counseling, uh, Anna loved the veterans and wanted very much to, to, to help them and indeed did help them all throughout the, the late 1940s. Um, and the women, right, they weren't quite able to just come back in seamlessly, right? Um, you mentioned in the book, some of the women couldn't mention that they'd had this experience, right? That wasn't what was valued in a woman, right? Right. So, I think, and I, right. And I think, I think that was a, I, I know that was a disappointment to Anna Rosenberg. Her philosophy was essentially, this goes all the way back to when she first came to the United States as a, as a, as a, you know, adolescent, as a little girl in the years before World War I. She knew that if women, her philosophy was if women sacrificed equal to the men, you know, obviously mm -hmm. they're not going to shoulder a rifle, but if they work the night shift, you know, building the, 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 the bomber, the bomber planes and so forth, they would earn a social equality that they could then, you know, consolidate uh, more, a more social uh, equality, uh, greater voice in the democracy that they helped save. And, you know, for these returning women to come back and to, you know, sort of be pressured into, you know, in the 1950s to becoming housewives and mothers and going out living in the suburbs, that was kind of a bitter pill because I think Anna would have thought, here's a stepping stone for more women in politics, more women in leadership at all levels of government, both state and federal. And it didn't quite, it, it finally happened, but it took, you know, we, we got Condoleezza Rice and Madeleine Albright and all these governors and, and Congress people that are women, but it took a longer time than I think Anna would have wanted. That was one of the things I was really surprised about, right? That how many women FDR had in his cabinet um, and in other roles, the same with Truman. And then um, once, Kennedy came in, right? He had zero, zero yeah, women. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. she was, <laughs> I can imagine, right yeah. after reading about like, you know, her colorful, how colorful her language would be, like what she probably said behind closed doors. But like, again, right? Like, what a hard pill. It very much was. Not only for her, but for, you know, Eleanor Roosevelt was, she only had a couple more years to live. But Eleanor Roosevelt told Kennedy, you know, this is your, you know, you want to have Anna on your cabinet, you know, pretty frankly, mm -hmm. and that she wasn't the only person to tell Kennedy that there were a lot of voices that were suggesting Anna as a cabinet member, the previous presidencies had all had going back to FDR had all women cabinet members or, or it all had women on the cabinet. And it just seemed like, okay, now maybe we have two women on the cabinet, you know, maybe transportation and labor or something like that. And to not have any. In fact, to have virtually no women in important decision-making power at all in the Kennedy years, really um, not a good look. And, you know, Anna was disappointed. Eleanor Roosevelt was disappointed. Women across the country were disappointed in that. And, um, you know, but it was an all-male affair, the, the, the Kennedy administration. It was almost all males. Um, one of the other major events I'd like to get to, because we do have just a few more minutes before we open for Q&A, um, she was recommended by General Marshall to be the assistant defense secretary. And this was a big deal for a number of reasons, right? One, she was a civilian. Um, two, it was the highest post in the government a woman would have. Um, yeah. And then there, and, and so she ultimately came under attack because this is during uh, McCarthy years. Okay. And Right, so being um, an immigrant, being a woman, being Jewish, right? These were all other elements of her person that he could latch on to attack. So sure. could you speak to how she was able to weather that period? Yes, it's a remarkable story, Kelsey. Uh, George Marshall, in the desperate early days of the Korean War, Marshall had been pulled out of retirement. You know, he's the guy that was the architect of victory in World War II. He'd been pulled out of retirement by Truman. He was now the Secretary of Defense. One of the first things he does is write a letter to Anna Rosenberg, the civilian woman 
you know, in New York, who's now she's a businesswoman, right? She's continued her career, but she's there opening letters one day. And there's a letter from George Marshall saying, please come to the Pentagon, be my number two. We need to rebuild the American army and strengthen it because we're, we're occupying Germany, Japan. We're trying to keep the Soviets in Eastern Europe. And now we have this disastrous war in Korea. Remarkable. She's mm -hmm. a, a Jewish woman. She's an immigrant. She speaks with an accent. Um, mm -hmm. She's a civilian. And her last name is Rosenberg, which was an un yeah. un right. unfortunate coincidence. She had no relation to Ethel and Julius Rosenberg, the atomic spies, none whatsoever. But Rosenbergs around the country were shunned uh, at, mm -hmm. those, at that time. And she knew she wore the bullseye. She said to both Truman and to, to, to General Marshall, you know, if, if you want me to take my name out of the ring, I will do it. But mm -hmm. Marshall said, no way. I need you there. I need you to be with me and get this job done. So um, she was uh, the victim of a smear campaign, but right before the full Senate confirmation. And uh, I don't want to say too much about that chapter because I uh, would like your readers to, to see what happened. But um, it's McCarthy, pretty suspenseful. <laughs> that's Kelsey, that's where the movie is. You know, it won't be yeah. a biopic, but I could see, you know, Natalie Portman playing Anna and. and <laughs> It was two weeks in December of 1950, where Anna yeah. Rosenberg's career as a decorated public servant hung in the balance. Um, it was very dramatic, yes. Listen, I must have read through those pages like lickety split, right? Like it, her story there, if I could not sound like a sales pitch here, right? There, <laughs> I started writing down her list of accomplishments and uh, abandoned it, right? Because then I wasn't really focusing on the story as much. I was paying attention to like taking these notes, yeah. but also like, it was like the length of my arm, like, oh, yeah, 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 right. So for those in the audience, I wanted to open this with, here's a list of her accomplishments, but I, I kind of figured if we just spoke on a, a couple, which even now it's still like half a dozen, um, you know, you could kind of see what an amazing person she was. And um, I'd, I'd kind of like to, for just a minute, speak to, right? Why did she get forgotten? How? Like, yeah. how is this the yeah. first book on her? Yes. Yeah, it, it, it's a remarkable thing. She was even when she was running parallel with Frances Perkins in, in the Roosevelt years, um, you could make an argument that Anna Rosenberg was, well, with, with Eleanor Roosevelt. Eleanor Roosevelt was the most important because she was symbolic too. But for a stretch of American history, uh, you know, between World War II and the Korean War, Anna Rosenberg uh, was the most powerful woman in American politics, you know, or the most influential woman in American politics, maybe the better word to say, um, as Eleanor Roosevelt was getting very, very old and at, toward the end of her life. Um, and why, you know, she was on the cover, uh, Anna was on the cover and in the pages of all these leading magazines, Time and Life, mm -hmm. Saturday Evening Post, she was featured in The New Yorker. Why did she disappear? And the, we just touched on it, but the, the unfortunate coincidence of the shared surname is certainly part of it. Um, you know, the, the very year that Anna was taking her position at the Pentagon, the Rosenbergs in New York were arrested. And the very year that uh, Anna left the Pentagon, they were executed. So having that name was was not, it didn't convince Anna to trumpet her own accomplishments. And yeah. not only that, she didn't want to anyway. That was not who she was. You know, she, it was never about her. Even when she really got famous in like 1942, she's everywhere in 1940. She's in Vogue in 1942, Vogue magazine. And <laughs> it was just never about her. It was always back to the president or back to winning the war or back to women or back to uh, expanding democracy. So um, she did not want to uh, tout her own accomplishments. And when Eleanor Roosevelt and Edward R. Murrow said, you have a memoir to write or an autobiography to write, she said, I'm not interested. And that's a big reason why as well. Yeah. We haven't heard of her in the ensuing decades. <laughs> Well, I do want to take some time to ask some of the audience questions. Yes. yes. Um, so we kind of skated over her years before FDR. So what can you tell us about her life before she became involved with the Roosevelt's? I'm going to keep this very brief because I know you have a list of questions. 
Anna came to the United States as a, as a, as a young girl, 12, 13 years old, was immediately very patriotic, loved the country, loved having a voice in a democracy. It was at the, the very moment that women were getting the right to vote. So she's just inflamed with a political love of politics, love of the game. And when she was, even in her 20s, she was mentored by uh, two very important people. One was a Tammany Hall operator. The other was a Bell Moskowitz, who was like the de facto chief of staff of the governor of New York. And at age 28, this is the pivotal thing, uh, Anna Rosenberg meets Eleanor Roosevelt at an event and becomes part of the team that helped Franklin Roosevelt win the governorship of New York. The next year, the Great Depression falls upon the United States. A couple of years later, Franklin Roosevelt's in Washington. He brings her uh, onto the New Deal, where she's the only woman director of these massive New Deal programs like Social Security, where she was basically running New York State the social security program. And that's before World War II hits. So before that, that meeting with A. Philip Randolph, th these are the years before. So she was in the Roosevelt orbit all the way back in, to 28. And, um, and really for the rest of his life became closer and closer and closer to the point where the Washington, uh, I'm sorry, the Chicago Tribune said, with the exception maybe of Harry Hopkins, Anna Rosenberg might be the closest person to the president. Yeah. Um, let me see. Um, did she, are there any writings, any personal writings that she might have kept um, in regards to her experience with the McCarthy investigations? She did. She wrote a letter, which is in the book, to Eleanor Roosevelt, um, just decrying what had happened to her. You know, she said, I, "I'm a decorated public servant, and you know, you, you know, it really feels awful to be targeted like this." So that's a, a moving letter to read. Her own writing um, was between World War II and about the mid 1960s. She did uh, pen a few um, a few articles for a few magazines and journals, and they're um, they're cited in the book. The last mm -hmm. one of of real uh, noteworthy is 1966, where she talks. She kind of talks about how the gains that women have made as of 1966, and the gains yet still to be made. So she you know, had a, you know, obviously a, a front row seat to that whole question. And uh, it's a pretty interesting thing, but she did write more than you might think. Um, but it was, it was sporadic, you know, it was World War II. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing is in, in 1966. And all of the events and everything that she was involved in, right? She <clears throat> was, doesn't even speak to how busy she was, right? There are descriptions in the book where she has, you know, two telephones that she's constantly answering. She would write off, you know, 400, I think she wrote letters to yeah. 400 families after coming back from one of her emissary trips, right? She, so um, the amount that she did write, I think is surprising given how much, I mean, she, of herself, she really poured into. Yeah, I mean, like she didn't drive. She never learned how to drive. So you can you can picture her in the back seat of of you know these the limos and the cars and everything, working. You know she's responding yeah. to letters or she's you know they didn't have cell phones obviously, but you could just I'm sure she used those times uh, to get work done because she was superhuman. Yeah, I mean, oh my gosh. <laughs> um, let's see. Scrolling, sorry. Okay. Um, what would you say in her background led her commitment to the rights of everyone that she helped? I think this is a great question. We sure is glossed over this. I think it I think it has to do with the circumstances of her own life. You know, she'd come from a prominent family in Budapest and had essentially been booted out. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, literally the emperor had broken a contract with her father and ruined him financially. And she gets to the United States and, you know, it's like your voice can be heard and more it, even more so for women, because, again, it's at the very moment women are getting the right to vote. So it was a fortunate timing for her, someone who's a natural leader, who is naturally into politics. But that was um, and, and I don't know, maybe being made fun of for her accent when she first got to New York. So she had a, maybe a built in sense of empathy. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, certainly we know that about Roosevelt with the, with his uh, being stricken with polio. But um, she was a champion, like uh, like Kel like Kelsey and I have, have spoken about, champion uh, for for Black Americans, for women, uh, for the for the disabled, and that was a consistent part of her who she was. Mm 
Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, her, her father was very, very patriotic yes. and very appreciative um, of yes. everything he was given and able to do in the U in, in America. Um, her, so the next question is her father had an interesting life and he must've had a profound influence on her. Do you think a book about him would be viable? I, I do. I think <laughs> the, problem, the problem there is, um, I think, it, I, I do think a researcher would run into, uh, it, it would be hard to dig up enough on Albert Lederer, especially mm -hmm. because he spent most of his life in the Austro-Hungarian em empire. It might be hard to, to get the research, but um, yeah, uh, I think that's, I'll leave it at that, but he's, he's a very interesting, she was, she seemed to get her politics from her father, um, mm -hmm. maybe rather than her mother. So yeah, that, that is an interesting thing, but, uh, uh, without Albert Letterer, there's no, we're not having this conversation. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, what involvement, if any, did she have in the civil rights act signed by LBJ? I can't point and didn't find a specific instance other than she and Johnson had been close since 1937. Johnson, when he first came to Congress, needed to, to win his literally his first congressional race. He needed some money and Anna Rosenberg gave him $500 in 1937. They saw eye to eye on the civil rights issue uh, mm -hmm. after the Selma March after the the terrible uh, violence uh, on the Pettus Bridge, um, and and then Johnson's speech to the nation, Anna wrote a very moving letter to him, uh, saying, "I've you know," and she she obviously had been through World War II with Roosevelt, but said, "I've never seen a president this great and magnificent before," and uh, he sent a very moving response to her. So, I, you know, she did help concretely. She helped. Johnson make the Vietnam draft more fair racially and socioeconomically. Um, but I know she saw eye to eye with him on social, on, on, uh, on civil rights. Mm -hmm. Great question. <clears throat> um, there's a question about whether she was a practicing Jew and we know that she was not practicing. Um, there is a quote from her in the book that I would like to read because the question follows with did Jewish values drive her efforts? And as she is flying back from Korea, um, she wrote, I had the feeling as I flew home that if all the water I passed over was ink and every blade of grass a pen, I still could not write enough to tell of the magnificence of our fighting men. And that line, if all of the sea was ink, if all the water was ink, I comes from, a Jewish text. Um, I was trying to find it, <laughs> find it right before <laughs> we started. Um, and so I don't know if there's anything that you could speak to. Um, well, her, her father, like so many uh, Jews from Europe who emigrated to the United States at that time, at the turn of the century, you know, there was a pressure to Americanize or assimilate. And he certainly, you know, he certainly was that person and, and, and his family. Um, a couple of Zoom calls ago, one of the audience members, who was an 81-year-old rabbi, said, "I knew, I knew Anna Rosenberg because my mother had worked for her in New York at her at her company, uh, her PR company." And he said, "We were talking about sort of Anna was a not observant, right? She was not an observant Jew." Um, and he said, "Well, she was observant the day she came to my bar mitzvah up on the oh. Upper West Side." When he was like 13 or 14, yeah, and he's 81. So he and I had a, an exchange afterwards too, which is pretty wonderful. Um, but that's that's wonderful about the quote too. The, yeah. the quote, right? I didn't know the, the etymology of the quote or the origins, but that's pretty wonderful. Yeah, um, it, yeah, that, <clears throat> I mean, it just sounds poetic, right? You know, it just, and, and th that is the imagery that she conjured thinking about, oh, I mean, all the stories that she, kind of had now that she'd met with all of these people. Yeah. So yeah. Um, that was definitely and, one. I and for, the, the, um, and for the, the, the reader that had that question, uh, Anna Rosenberg was instrumental in, in uh, aid to, from New York and the greater New York region, aid to the refugees, Jewish refugees after the war. So um, that's uh, amply talked about in the book, but um, an important mm -hmm. chapter also in her life. Yeah. Um, <laughs> There's so much that she was involved in. I can't even like, 
remember <laughs> like oh yeah that's right she did that. Not oh, too yeah. good to be true. she's a real person <laughs> right yeah right. yeah um let me see i i know i passed over one or two questions um to kind of keep in order um, there is a question um, about the phrase Rosie the Riveter um, and if the Rosie had anything to do with her surname. No, I think there's a dispute as to, I don't think they really know who that is. I've heard um, it was a, a Rose, somebody, somebody from like Harlan County, Kentucky, who came up to Detroit, maybe Ypsilanti, Michigan, and got a job building uh, at the Willow Run plant. That's what I've heard. Uh, Rose, Rose Pulaski, maybe, was the name of the person that they think it came from. But um, Anna Rosenberg had a lot of conversations with women that looked a lot like Rosie the Riveter, you know, the bandanas and, uh, operating the machines, um, when she was doing the tours of the factories and, and the like. Um, but great question. Um, I want to give a shout out. Does anybody else have any other questions for the Q and a, um, since we do have about six or seven minutes left, um, in the meantime, I would like to ask. Um, so this is a bit of your stylistic choices in telling the story. And uh, you take, um, I mean, I don't wanna say a lot, but there, you take a, a decent amount of time to describe the way people look, right? Yeah. Obviously one of the things is, I'm gonna say obviously, no one else in here has read the book, but Anna wore these amazing hats and you do take the time to describe a lot of her hats, but also, um, you know, the, the stony look someone might be giving or the, the color of a man's suit. I mean, you do take a lot of time to describe yeah. the way people look. Could you um, share maybe why you thought that was also important to include? I think it was, uh, it was a lesson that I learned over the writing. Um, I would have, when I started writing, uh, really almost like April 2019, I would write in sort of the way that I thought the story needed to be told, which was sort of on the drier side. And mm -hmm. I would beta test it with readers and it just wasn't, you know, it wasn't selling to them. You know, it wasn't, they weren't finding the story there. So I remember my godfather read an early draft of about half the book. And he said, you know, you mentioned all these places where she lived, but you never really described, you know, he's like, go online and figure out what building it was and you know, try and figure out what the building might've looked like. So I literally, Kelsey went through the book and I, and I did that. And, you know, in, in the, the newspaper reporters and, in, 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 you know, all, the newspaper reporters often talked about what she wore. That was a thing. You know, they yeah. would all, always talk about her appearance. But in terms of like where she lived, the different apartments and the different offices, the interiors, that was all sort of, I just learned to add that because I think it helps people uh, maybe center themselves in the story. Yeah. Um, her habit of waving the unlit cigarette. You know, <laughs> these are all things that I wouldn't have thought to add when I was first starting the writing. But I realized to tell a story like this that people want to pick mm -hmm. up, maybe go on an airplane ride, you know, reading, you know, you have to sort of add, you know, you you, you extrapolate, you, you mm -hmm. make uh, informed decisions about this based on the research. But, you know, you really do, I think, for this type of history, this narrative type of history, you do have to add a lot of these sort of... Uh, cinematic touches, if you like, or novelistic touches. Yeah, no, I mean, right, I I can, there, so there's photographs of Anna yeah. in the book, yeah. right? So I can picture her face, right? But then being able to visualize, you know, the, the black hat that she wore in mourning versus, yes. um, you know, another hat that she wore, the bangles, that was yeah. Yeah. a great, great detail to hear, right? She's going through the Pentagon and everybody, you know, is in all these military garb and she's got these bangles that are, you know, and, going. And her, her, grand, her grandson loves that story because the generals and the admirals would, you know, hide. They'd hear the, <laughs> the heels and the bangles and they sort of, they shut the door because they didn't want to work as hard as she was. Yeah. Um, right. Which leads to another question. Um, was her family involved in the development of the book at all? Yes, yes. Um, uh, her, she had, she and her first husband had one son. Uh, he died in the year 2000, well before any of this, uh, the book started. Um, but her grandson, they had one grandson, she had one grandson, and he was, uh, he uh, sat for interviews for the book, was very gracious with his time. He had fond and extremely moving memories of his grandmother. And, and that's really the, the key is, she was his grandmother, 
you know, yeah. she wasn't this, you know, military, you know, you know, stylish woman at the top of the military establishment. She was, you know, a woman that that liked to garden and liked to grow her roses and liked to take care of him and take him to Broadway plays and have nice dinners with him. So he tells this great story of he's at a, he went to a boarding school for high school and on Sunday nights, he's a teenager. He'd make three phone calls, one to his father, it would last a few minutes, one to his mother, she may or may not answer, one to his grandmother, collect okay. call, right? She would yeah. pick up every time and he'd be on the phone for an hour, hour and a half. Um, that's who she was. Yeah. I love that. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, yeah. I, my, my grandmother also lived long distance. Yeah. So I remember yeah. having hour long calls with her as well. Um, I think for uh, my last question, I want to ask what, in your esteemed opinion, as the Anna Rosenberg expert, <laughs> um, what is her greatest lasting impact? I think the, you know, the one that probably, you know, the subtitle Shape Modern America, how, how really, if I were to try and make an argument that she really did that, how would you do it? Well, I think it was that first trip to Europe. On, at the behest of Franklin Roosevelt, where she's there with the troops during World War II. And when they had conjured up the GI Bill, they didn't quite realize what direction it was going to go in, whether these guys wanted to learn how to operate a new machine, whether they wanted vocational training, whether they wanted dance lessons, you know, what they wanted. And she found uh, over in her, her weeks uh, traveling with the troops that they wanted higher education. They wanted to go to college. Mm -hmm. And that generation had you know never dreamed of that before they'd been uh uh great depression then war that was it and you know for them to to want a piece of the country that they helped save and she was delighted to know this she was delighted to tell roosevelt this and he was delighted to start grafting that on to what became the gi bill yeah it, and that really did transform because millions of americans are elevated into the middle class yeah. and uh <clears throat> Not always fairly, but uh, that's another story. But elevated yeah. millions of Americans in the middle class, and and that's her greatest accomplishment, in my opinion. 